All right, so this is what's going on in the South. What's going on in Washington? President James Buchanan is still the president, and um, Southerners in his cabinet, radical Southerners, insist that Buchanan must recognize, the rea acknowledge secession, say, okay, I don't like it, but these states are now out of the Union. Secretary of the Treasury Cobb, Thompson of Mississippi, these are radical secessionists, and Buchanan is weak and vacillating, but he does not. The, it, this is the, the irony of Buchanan is he ends his, he ends his uh, presidency as the head of a pro-union northern government. As these states secede, the members of the cabinet leave, but even before that, in, in this December 4th, Buchanan sends his annual message to Congress. And it's very wishy-washy, as you would expect, and trying to satisfy all sorts of different pressures. He assured the South that the nature of the presidency was such that a president by himself couldn't do anything uh, to injure the South. He called on the North to stop meddling with Southern institutions. But he said explicitly, the election of a single man is not a legitimate reason to break up the Union. He repudiated secession, which was a shock to many people who had seen him under the thumb of the South. He said the government has a right to enforce the law, but not to send troops into a state to do so. Now, interestingly, when Lincoln gave his inaugural address, he took some sentences from Buchanan's message. The sentences repudiating secession end up in Lincoln. So Buchanan is not totally a pro-Southern by any means. On the other hand, there's not much he can do about it, he says. William Seward said of uh, Buchanan's message, I think the president has conclusively proved two things. One, no state has a right to secede unless it wishes to. <laughs> and two, it is the duty of the president to enforce the law unless somebody opposes him. What is the constitutional position? Who knows? I, I keep telling you, the Constitution is immaterial here. It just doesn't apply. There is a clause in the Constitution authorizing the federal government to put down insurrections in states. The federal government has the power, but in the original draft, it had just said that. The impetus would come from the federal government, but as finally adopted, it requires either the governor or the legislature of a state to call for federal aid. In other words, if there's an insurrection in New York and the governor, the governor of New York cannot deal with it, he can ask President Obama to send federal troops in. But President Obama cannot send federal troops, at least under that article, if Cuomo says, I don't want your troops, or the legislature. It but now, none of these southern states are asking for federal troops, obviously. Lincoln will eventually say, well, there's been an insurrection which has abolished the governments there, so there is no sitting legislature or governor who can fulfill this function. But anyway, now, when Congress met, the chaos reigned. I mean, there were dozens of compromise proposals were introduced. Nobody knew at that point what Lincoln's position was. Some Republicans, like Horace Greeley of New York, the editor of the very influential New York Tribune, were saying, okay, erring sisters, go in peace. Go. You don't like it here? Go. We, we don't think this is a good idea, but it's your decision. Most Republicans, and indeed most Northern Democrats, of course, were adamantly opposed to recognizing secession. All sorts of compromise proposals, I said, floated around. Um, Business leaders in the North were strongly in favor of compromise. New York merchants, industrialists from New England sent delegations down to Washington to, to pressure for compromise, to give in to the South in one way or another. Um, there was a run on banks. The stock market went way down. There was all this you know, political chaos. Um, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, business leaders mobilized to try to get Congress to compromise and solve the problem. They failed. It's a very interesting moment in that the country's political leadership and economic leadership were completely at odds with each other. This is not so usual. The business leadership of the North 
was incapable of getting what it wanted politically. Normally, business, you know, normally the upper class can get what they want politically. Not in this case. Their, their pleas were ignored. Democrat, the Douglas Democrats in the Northwest were adamantly against secession, and Douglas himself said, the Northwest will never let the mouth of the Mississippi River fall into the hands of a foreign power. There's still enough trade on the Mississippi. We will never be isolated from our outlets, west and south. So forget about recognizing the South as a, as a, separate, um, as a separate nation. Douglas put forward compromise. The main compromise, the, uh, committees of Congress were set up in the House and the Senate, um, to, but the room for compromise was very small. The deep South states, the seceding states said, forget about compromise, this is over. We are out, we're not interested in any compromise. Compromise efforts at this point are directed at the upper South. What will be necessary to keep those eight slave states in the Union? Nothing is going to convince South Carolina to come back. What is necessary to keep those other states from seceding? The main compromise proposal was put forward by Senator John Crittenden, I've mentioned him before, of Kentucky, the self-styled successor of Henry Clay as the great compromiser from Kentucky. And Crittenden put it forward in a series of proposed constitutional amendments, the last of which said, these amendments are unamendable. In other words, they can never be changed. The Constitution, one of its unique or innovative elements in the era it was written was it contains the process for its own amendment, right? Three quarters of the states, two thirds of Congress. The founders knew that the Constitution would have to be updated in some ways in the future in ways they couldn't anticipate. The Crittenden plan would be unamendable. And it dealt with various things, fugitive slaves, other stuff, but the main element was on the territorial question. Basically extending the Missouri Compromise Line, remember the bottom, the southern boundary of Missouri, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Dividing all the territories north of the Missouri Compromise Line, no slavery, south of the Missouri Compromise Line, slavery. All right, resurrect that Missouri Compromise which had been repealed, declared unconstitutional, resurrect it, divide the territories, solve the problem. Um, but the Crittenden plan included a little uh, ringer in there which made it impossible for Republicans to accept it. This would apply, it says, to, to all territories currently in the United States or hereafter acquired. Or hereafter acquired. That is an invitation for Southern expansion. See? Cuba, Central America, anything acquired south of the Missouri line would become a slave area. Um, all U.S. territory and all hereafter required. Now, Crittenden is definitely opposed to secession. In fact, he stays in the Union, the whole, so does Kentucky. Um, and he warns the alternative to compromise is civil war, he said, tells the Senate in, 18th, in January. The alternative is civil war. And civil war will inevitably lead to the abolition of slavery. He said, you think you're going to throw slavery? The days of slavery are numbered, he said, if this problem is not solved right now. So it, it, you can't blame Southerners for not hearing these kinds of warnings.